Now I want to speak about what I think is one of the major injustices in America today. It's the advent of Pepsi, they see, and Tagum, and Nexium, and Perlisec, and Rolades, and Tums, and all the rest of them. I'll tell you why. I'm a little Italian kid. Just the first commercials that caught my eye. I can't eat my mother's chicken cacciatore. Because when I eat it, it gives me heartburn. So rest up my mom, who's been cooking the kitchen all day. I'll take a little pink pill. I'm happy. My mom's happy. And that's that. First commercial. See that one? Next commercial goes like this. Two mothers are going to the fast food restaurant. Kids are back in the van. Mom says, have some onion rings. I know I can't eat those. Why not? Because when I eat those, it gives me heartburn. Oh, no. You take the little pink pill, you eat all the crap you want. <laughs> Is that what the commercials say? Yes. Are these people getting healthier or sicker? They're getting sicker. Why? Why are they getting sicker? Because not asking the question. Hey, Bozo, you can't eat your mother's chicken cacciatore. How about that? It hurts you when you eat that food. Your body is literally telling you that. But you're not listening. You think the little pink pill knows more. Hey, lady, you can't have those onion rings. They hurt you when you eat that food. Your body is literally telling you that. But you're not listening. You think the little pink pill knows more. Now listen, I am not anti-medication or anti-surgery. I have a tremendous respect for the medical community. Make no mistake about that. What I'm against, I'm against abuse. Let me tell you what happened. We have individuals that have this chronic heartburn business, okay? And if that continues, they're going to burn a hole in their esophagus. And we spoke that that's not a good thing. So what do we do? We develop medications to help them with this, knowing when they take it, yes, it's going to disrupt their digestive system. Yes, their liver and detoxify the drugs. However, it's the lesser of two evils. You got that? From now on, any time you take a medication of any type, know you have made the choice. Lesser of two evils. Drugs are not good for you. Medication is not good for you. It will never be good for you. However, sometimes it's what? Necessary. Necessary. So we prescribe a million of these drugs. No one dies. Beautiful. So then what do we do? We make them over the counter. So how do you learn about them? Who teaches you? TV, right? TV, magazines, radio ads, free samples. They give it to you. So now what do I have? The general population self-medicating. Not asking any questions. Like, maybe I shouldn't beat this crap in the first place. Maybe I'm not chewing my food 20, 30 times before I swallow. Maybe I have a food combining problem, an acid base problem, a hernia problem, self joe bowel problem. No questions are being asked. Take the little pink pill, go about your merry way. Be careful of that scenario because you'll be living your life what I call in disease care, not in health care. We're speaking about that a little bit later on. Multiple studies have come out now and said people that have been taking these types of medications for long periods of time are now developing hip fractures. Mm. Mm. How come? What happened? What are we doing? Huh? We take a drug, we buffer the acid in our stomach, we can no longer break the food down like we're supposed to, we get a malabsorption problem, and years later you got a hip fracture problem. Lesser of two evils. You have to be careful, okay? Stomach. I want you to think of your stomach as a blender. The stomach's job is to break everything down. Complex carbohydrates, starches, proteins should break up. We do not feed the body through the stomach. What does cross the stomach wall quite easily is water, aspirin, and alcohol. These three things will cross the stomach and bring quite easily. So let's speak about that. You're Mother Nature. You're the creator of the human body. We're made up to 75% water. When we want water to go in or it wants to go in our bodies, what do you think? You made up to 75% water. Water can do whatever it wants to do in our bodies, okay? Aspirin. Is aspirin one of the most effective drugs invented of all time? It is, isn't it? Why is it? I just told you. What does it do? Crosses the membrane, goes in the bloodstream now. Very effective. How, what's the side effect of aspirin? What does it cause? Bleeding, right? Gastrointestinal bleeding. That's why there is coated aspirin. Time-released aspirin. Different drug, drug derivatives from aspirin. Because we know 
The aspirin's very hard on the gut lining. Alcohol. How do some of you know that alcohol crosses the stomach membrane quite easily? Huh? A little much vino tonight, a little margaritaville, a little vino, right? Now, do pharmaceutical companies know this? Yes, they do. Pharmaceutical companies are one of the best in human physiology. They have scientists working around the clock, where things should go, where they shouldn't go, how they interact. They're very, very good. So then what does NyQuil have in it? Alcohol. No kidding. Let me tell you how NyQuil works. NyQuil does not take care of your stuffy nose. No. When you take a shot of NyQuil, you don't feel your nose anymore. You're drunk, right? <laughs> now, they're going to argue that that's not the way that it works, but yes, that's one of the ways that it works. In fact, if you watch the commercials, what do they call it? Nighttime medicine. You take it, you're going to bed now. I mean, they just tell you how it is, just know what you're doing, okay? So let's take a look at our stomach. Right here is the esophagus, okay? And the food's going to come down like this, and this is called the cardiac sphincter. It's a one-way valve that allows the food to go into the stomach. Now, why are they calling this the cardiac sphincter when we're here speaking about our stomach? It has to do with its location. You see, our stomach is located here. Okay, right here. All right? For some of us, we think it might be out to there, but actually it really is here, okay? And this valve is located by the heart, and therefore they call this the cardiac sphincter. Now, this has clinical significance. Because indigestion can mimic a heart attack. And a heart attack can mimic indigestion. Pressure on this valve is going to give you pressure here. Nine times out of ten, it is indigestion. But I'm going to ask you, if you have this sensation, please don't roll the dice and think it's not the other. Be sure, check it out. This is called the body or the fundus of the stomach. Here's the pyloric area of the stomach, and that's the pyloric valve that allows the food to go into the small intestine. All those fluid things in here are called gyri arugula. I like to call them gyri. Now think of your stomach as a wrinkled balloon. You squeeze everything out of it by now, it's on empty. And as you fill with water and food, it needs to do what? Expand. And the gyri allow us to do that. Now I have to get a little technical with you, but here it is. In the gyri, there are some cells and they're called oxenic cells. They're the ones who make the hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is very important for what? The actual breakdown of our food. Then they make mucus. The stomach has a one millimeter, very, very dense line of mucus, to protect it from the high levels of acid we're gonna produce. And then it makes a protein called intrinsic factor, which we're gonna speak about. There are some other cells, just follow me on this stuff, I'll tell you what to know. They're called chief cells. They make pepsinogen. When the pepsinogen interacts with the hydrochloric acid, it becomes what they call pepsin. All you need to know is the pepsin is what breaks down the protein in our stomach. Therefore, the drug called what? Pepsidac. Pepto-bismol. Maybe Pepsi soda. I have no idea. But now you know where they come up with some of that stuff, you see? And backing up again, we have some cells in our stomach. They're called oxidic cells. And they make hydrochloric acid, mucus, and intrinsic factor. What is intrinsic factor? Intrinsic factor's job is to go out and find vitamin B12. That's its job. Without intrinsic factor, we will not absorb vitamin B12. Forget what anybody wants to tell you. You have to have intrinsic factor in your body to absorb vitamin B12. The only other way you get B12 into the bloodstream is you take it and you what? Inject it. You put it in there, you inject it. Or there is a liquid vitamin B12 that you can put underneath the tongue and the sublingual gland will pick it up. So this is how this works. This is intrinsic factor and this is vitamin B12. It finds it in the small intestine and the large intestine and it grabs it in what we call a lock and key bond in biochemistry. Anytime your reader hear that, what they're telling you is, once you find it, takes it up, lock it up, take the key, and throw it away. Not letting go. Very strong bond. And then it gets absorbed and stored into the liver. So why do we need vitamin B12? Vitamin B12 is very important for the maturation of red blood cells. Without the B12, our red blood cells will not mature. They'll die early. How much vitamin B12 do we need a day? Five micrograms. That's the RDA. 
Repetitive allowance is 5 micrograms. Our liver is going to store 4,000 to 5,000 micrograms. A lot more. So Mrs. Jones comes into the office. Hi, Mrs. Jones. How are you? Oh, I'm messed up again. What's wrong with you, Mrs. Jones? Oh, for a month now, each leg feels like it weighs 100 pounds. I wake up tired. I have no strength. Everything is double the effort. By the end of the day, I'm totally fried on the couch. Something's wrong with me. So what do you think she hears from me? What do you think? What do you think I say? What do you think? Yeah, 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 right, exactly. But you can't rush. As a doctor, you can't rush. You gotta go like this, watch. Hmm, you have to have a good one. You don't say it too. Hmm. And then you can ask the questions. Talk to Mrs. Jones. Have you been sick? Have you changed your diet? Have you moved? Have you changed your job? Have you been in an accident? Have you changed your workout? Have you changed your supplements? Have you changed your diet? Nothing has changed. But something is wrong with me. All right, here's what we're going to do then. We'll do some lab work. You come back in a week. We can find out what's going on. So Mrs. Jones comes back in a week. Mrs. Jones, I know what's wrong with you. What? You have what they call pernicious anemia. She says, what's that? What it is is that your red blood cells are not maturing they're dying early, and it's usually caused by vitamin B12 deficiency. So Mrs. Jones says to me, well, gee, Dr. Andy, what are you suggesting? B-complex vitamins, B12 injections? I go, well, for the short term, that might help us. But I have a different question for you. What is it? I want to know what changed in your life four to five years ago. So what do you mean? See, it would have taken you four to five years to deplete all the B12 out of your liver. So, Mrs. Jones hasn't had this problem for a month, has she? She hasn't had this problem for three months, six months, one year, two years, three years. She's had this problem for four to five years. And now it shows up as a symptom and she ends up in my office. Look folks, I need to get on my healthcare soapbox with you just a few moments. Healthcare is not this week because you're at OHI. It's not the week after that. It's not even the week after that. Healthcare is every single day of our lives is healthcare. Not to be confused with disease care or crisis care. You end up in the hospital, you have a crisis situation. They are patching you up any which way they know how. It is 100% disease care. It has nothing to do with healthcare place like this has everything to do with health care. They call it the health care delivery system out there, prove that it isn't, somewhat of a negative story, but here it is. I have a patient of mine. He's 42. A virus has attacked his heart muscle. He has a cardiomyopathy. His heart muscle is dying on him. Call it bad luck, bad timing, wrong place at the wrong time. I have no idea what to call it. All I know, it's happened to him. And by the way, if he was among us here today with all of us, you wouldn't even know it was him. He no longer carries a heart transplant page, he's doing very well, because medication is sometimes what? Necessary, right? What is it going to be, the heart attack or the pill? So what happened? The very next day when I find out the news, lunchtime is the time that I have to go visit him, I race up here at Sharpe Hospital San Diego, this is a man in heart failure now. When I got there, what were they feeding him? What was he eating when I got there? Go ahead, you guys know, what is it? Yeah, it was a roast beef sandwich, a cup of jello, and a Pepsi. I said, Nick, what are you doing? He goes, what? Why are they giving you heart? They're killing you with this. Now, the health care, feeding them that? No. But not to beat them up, because they do a lot of great work. They really do. Let's just say that some of you went nuts on your detox. I've seen it happen before. And you come up here and you hit me in the head with a bat, like this, and you break my head wide open. I don't want wheatgrass juice, okay? I need stitches. The poultice can come later, but right now I need the stitches. So are they saving lives who are sitting here today? Of course they are. They're not here to beat them up. We're here to talk about how you should live your life. And here's the most important message I can give you. Here it is. 